hello. So we're preparing for the panel discussion. We'll have different people around here. And if we look at HackMD, we see there's already some seeded questions here, both from earlier and some new questions. Please continue adding them. And the basic idea is we'll go through these in some random order and give comments. You all can also be adding your comments directly under the questions, just like the rest of the HackMD stuff. And also maybe some of us will be writing our answers instead of speaking them. Um, let's see. So hopefully everyone has the HackMD link. So yeah, do we want to select a moderator for the panel discussion, like someone to keep us on time and keep things moving? I guess I can do that if no one else wants to, if you think that's not a conflict of interest somehow. <laughs> well, okay, I'll try to keep us going. So during the break, we were already quite interested in this first question here. So notebooks versus scripts. So there was a bit of a discussion in HackMD above. Um, so yeah, um, do you want to go through and each person can give their comments on the matter? Well, uh, I could, yeah, I could start uh, because I probably see that this uh, during the tools talk, I quickly mentioned that in the tools material, there's way too much material to go through. Uh, but if you're interested, you can look at it. There's like links to other stuff. But yeah, about the notebooks. So uh, to me, at least the notebook is inherently like interactive and it's, it's meant to it be this kind of a way of like making it easy to, to do interactive stuff, like plotting interactively or, or doing interactive, like going through data and stuff like that. So scripts are a bit more like, like uh, I'm ambiguous. You, you can run them the way you want. You can do whatever you want with them, but it's, it's more like run and done. Like you run a whole script. Usually you just run the whole script instead of like notebook where you like play around. It's like a uh, playing ground where you have all kinds of fancy things happening around you. Uh, Thomas. Well, in, in general, I would agree. Um, for me, notebooks are nice to um, present work, present some workflows. Um, they are not really good uh, for any kind of automation, automation um, because, yeah, they are, as Simo said, inherently interactive. So you can't just run them. And what I personally would do, um, at least where possible, even in a workflow, try to exclude as much computation from the notebooks and put it into functions that are called from notebooks, because then I can reuse those functions and reuse that functionality um, so, uh, again, uh, and also use it in a script. And then it's also much easier to just take uh, the commands or the yeah, the commands from that notebook and transfer it to a script. If there's uh, if there is a lot of func functions or functionality in that uh, in that notebook, it becomes a mess. It's not nice for presentation anymore. It's not easy to interact with it anymore, and it's getting more and more difficult to use. Yeah. Uh, you see. Thoughts. Yeah, I don't know if I have that much uh, more to add there. So it's, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, Brilliant is interactively playing around. That's uh, that's one major difference. And uh, if thinking personally, I think I I use notebooks mostly when when doing, let's say, some kind of analysis where I need to maybe modify a bit of data, do some computations. I I really want to sort of combine some. Uh, bits and pieces of, of scripting, some graphics, and maybe trying to document have uh, have maybe some maths there. I think that's that's nice thing that you can you can really have a text with uh, with latte and, and equations there. But then it if if really it's sort of 
more extensive computation, then it's then it's better to sort of make a, make a program out of that. And I think well, something mentioned by Thomas that actually try to make your functions or with the make your modules, which you can actually then use both from the script and and from the notebook itself. Yeah. Uh, right on. I think notebooks are really, really wonderful as supporting information, as supplementary material to a publication. I think they work great for the use case where you read data, then you do some statistics, at the end you plot the figures. So they are great for linear workflow because it's cell after cell after cell after cell. Uh, great point about that they are inherently interactive, but they don't have to be consumed interactively. I mean, they can be just consumed as a reference. How was this plot created? For situations that don't fit into this linear cell after cell after cell after cell, then they are less good. Yeah. So my thought was yeah, like you can do many things similar in both. Like you can use a notebook like a script or so on. But I think the main difference is how it's used. So most of the time when I see people using notebooks that are getting out of control, there's a whole bunch of stuff mixed together. And like there's no clear start or end. There's like in order to get your results, you have to run these 10 specific cells in a certain order. And then that's like, that's not very reproducible. On the yeah, other hand, add, yeah. Yeah, on, go right on the other yeah, hand you can make a notebook which is always run from start to end, and that's very similar to a script. So it's all about how it's used. And eventually you need to start making things more modular. And then, well, it's both leaving the notebook, but then also organizing your notebooks a bit better. Yeah, I would say that like sometimes it, it's easy the freedom of notebooks makes happen. You might end up in a situation where you run the cells and then you go back in order, you run some cells and then you go to a different place and you run some other cells. And at the end you get a like error or something. And then you ask what, why did I encounter the error? And the error might just be because like it had strayed so far from the like logical path of the, of the, like you, you had basically like went back and forwards in the in the script so it becomes like a uh, like a time travel movie where you cannot anymore follow who's who ever like who's mm. where and what's happening here like it's too complicated and 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 in those kind of situations it's usually like good idea to stop and think about like how what you actually want to do and if you have like a, i want to do this with these things and i want to get here it might be better to like make the script easier to read uh make the movie easier for the for everybody and and make it linear so you don't have like back like this kind of like uh there's a jumping back in time and forwards and this kind of nonsense in your movie plot mm -hmm. that's actually i think also the big danger of notebooks that um, you're, you can't really be sure what state you're in. Mm -hmm. And you can end up with a, with a state where you suddenly get really nice results for something because one parameter that is named whatever changed because of a later execution of something and you went back to something uh, uh, from earlier and it can completely mess up your um, analysis. Uh, so at least for final results um, or result determination, I think notebooks can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Should we move forward to the next question yep. yeah. on the docket? There's a lot of them. Yeah. Maybe so go through them. Next was how to version your data, which I'm really curious what the answers will be. Any takers? Yeah, this is a kind <laughs> of complicated <laughs> topic. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, go right ahead, Thomas. If you have, have no, a... no, go... <laughs> I think okay. no one wants so, to so, be the yeah. first one here. <laughs> yeah, so so I'd, I'd I personally go like like it, there's no no good one solution because like it depends on what what the situation is. Like if you have if your data isn't a lot of data, mm -hmm. you can just like keep track of them in in like a file or so, like a like a data sheet that contains like what data files you have and what parameters did you use and stuff like that. If you have files that are big data, so-called, you need to think about like 
also the question also brings into mind that do you need to version the data like in many cases data is generated automatically based on a code like you have a, maybe some original data that is like you might have different tiers of data you have original data that is like somebody went to the deepest jungles and they made some measurements and you cannot recreate that data like that's really hard to do and and then you might do like processing on that and recreate the data and that data can be something that can be recreate it always if you have the original code so if you if you version control the code you also version control the data basically uh, of course some data is very might be consuming to calculate and in those cases it might be uh well big data is always hard to like uh version control usually hopefully you don't need to have multiple copies of it but uh, yeah then there's no one one good solution for that i i, I would like just born against like storing everything uh, and keeping mind because then then like you don't have any okay like it's it's the same as let's say with music like if you compress everything in the audio uh, so that it lo sounds loud everything sounds loud and there's no dynamic range anymore and then you cannot like this might sound this uh, might not matter to you uh, but but uh, you don't see you don't hear anything anymore and that same kind of stuff can happen with data that you have like you, if you treat every you know, every piece of data as equals, then you might end up in a situation where you actually lose the important data because it wasn't stored at the correct place. So it might be a good idea to differentiate between different types of data and version control that data maybe that is actually necessary. Yeah. Um, any other takers for this question? I mean, maybe one one point for this uh, data is that uh, if the data is something that is produced from computation from a code, then if if possible, it would be and as said, I mean, as Simo mentioned, in in some cases, it's in at least in principle, it's possible to sort of uh, return the data, but if you can somehow attach to the data that with software, and if possible with version, uh, maybe sometimes even the git hash that was used mm. to create the data, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, input parameters and so on. I mean, the input files for scientific computing, they are not necessarily that big. So if you can somehow keep that data, um, that, that information together with the data, it, it will really help in reproducing the data in, in yeah. later on if needed, or just checking out that, okay, if everything is, is okay with the data. So. If I said that versioning data is very specific to your workflow, do people agree with that or think there's some general strategies? No one knows. Okay, so this is a hard question. I think, I think what you see was I think what you see said is um, probably the most sensible approach to versioning data. If, if your data is generated by yourself mm -hmm. uh, in any way, then version how you generated it so that it can be regenerated. Mm -hmm. um, if you get data from outside, um, uh, they, there is no real way to version the data. The only thing you can do is version which output is produced from what at what time point with what input per input mm -hmm. information so if you have let's say if you get additional users you could uh, version okay i had users one to three thousand at this point when i created that output and now i have one to four thousand from my database mm -hmm. that is something you can but that yes. is essentially the same uh, yeah store the meta metadata for what you are doing with it one so thing that, that i produce should I, I personally like try to listen myself is that like the, the idea that how long does it like if this data is gone how long does it take me to do it again like if it mm -hmm. if I know the code and I know that the, the code can recreate the data and I know it takes computation time but it takes like let's say a week it's nothing too serious but if I know that okay like my, my whole like my thesis is relying on this one data file and it's like it's on the USB drive somewhere like then you think that okay like maybe i need to like 
make it in, in check. And similarly, if you have a big project and if you reach a point where it's like, okay, now we are getting something and now it's important to like probably keep like, it's important because we like, now we are at the point where we would lose a lot of information. So I would look at it from that point of view, basically, like how much are, are you willing to lose if something happens? And usually it's, yeah, usually it's, uh, I would say like a month's work or something, how much I would be willing to lose. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think we should go on. Yeah. So there's two upcoming questions. What to do when you can't get help in your organization? And what do you teach in a code refinery workshop? Is it worth taking it? Any thoughts? Come for help. Um, yeah, try to find the find relevant groups for your specific either questions or for your specific field. Um, if it's for computational questions, for example, Nordic RSE um, or the code refinery as such uh, can be good resources and are normally, well, happy to help. Um, like lately, lately, we've been doing a lot of thinking about how to build these. Oh, right on. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, maybe we don't know the answer either, but happy to get more questions there, like on code refinery chat or on a Nordic Resource Software Engineers coffee break to pop in, uh, tell us what the, what the problem is and we will we can maybe try to connect you to the right community, the right people, the right solution. And and also uh, answering the question, what we do in code refinery workshops, uh, the, we, we teach things that uh, Simo has mentioned, uh, version control, how to collaborate with colleagues, how to document, how to test, how to have a reproducible, uh, workflow environment documentation for our codes and scripts and visualization to be reusable and not only for other people but also for our future selves and is it worth it i think so it's i think it's very worth it i'm biased oh i hope to see you there <laughs> i think lately I would... go ahead sima uh no go right ahead yeah like i think lately we had a lot of thinking into how to like well, no. Like, lately, there's a lot of recognition that the support of computing is really important and often lacking. Mm. And, well, we're trying to make things better. If you're in Finland, CSC is always available. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I would. I would definitely also mention that, like pick and choose like there's no like usually none of this costs anything like like that it's available on the internet uh it's available in the wider world it doesn't really matter if if university in japan has written to the instructions for their mm. cluster if they can introduce you to the correct concepts that you can then use in your own system so basically like if you feel that you found good resources somewhere else like for example mit has the courses in youtube and like I often go and check, well, YouTube anyways, like what's what's there, what's new there. Like somebody else can introduce the same concept to you better than we can or some um, somebody else can. And if you feel like that helps you, then those channels are always good. It, it like, it doesn't matter that which way you re uh, learn the thing, if it helps you, but these are good. Like Codefront is excellent place. But if you feel like, uh, if you find like internet this wide, there's lots of stuff there as well. Yeah. Um, next up is a question, keeping track of requirements and dependencies, for example, package updates in R. Um, any thoughts on this? Well, I can quickly... Main reason... Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> now you start. My main reason why I don't really like R because the update cycles are too fast. Um, yeah, in, in general, it, I think it's difficult. Um, try to, in your own code, try to specify as good as possible what versions you're using. If, um, if you are using versions, especially in R, because things are changing so fast. And then 
worst case, stick to those versions um, unless you need some newer, uh, yeah, unless you need some newer stuff. It's all, it, I, may, I mean, in my opinion, it's always fine to use old stuff if it works. And if you don't need the newest features for something, don't use it. If it, make, if it makes your code better by using the newest features, okay, then it makes sense to change. But if it doesn't really neither improve your code as such nor your performance, um, there's no reason to update, except if there's security issues. But yeah, that would be improving your code yeah. or your performance. Yeah, I would also say that, that often, like, like if you look at, let's say, uh, models, or machine learning models or something that are available in GitHub that people have like published and their packages are really outdated. They might be like super outdated. Uh, that often also like, uh, like there's, there's technical solutions for these. There's technical solutions such as the singularity containers that try to like make the whole operating system into one file and all kinds of stuff. There's all, like in the, in the question itself, there was a interesting technical solution I hadn't heard of, but it's, uh, I need to, like now we investigate. Uh, so there are usually technical solutions of keeping track of the environments uh, of what you need. But there's also like this kind of like, how could I say it? Like if, if you start a project and you want it to be used, uh, usually you need it to be like updated. Uh, and, and there's the easiest way of keeping it updated is to make it publicly available and easy to contribute to. Because then, it, like, if somebody says that, okay, in the new version of this package, you get this kind of a bug, then people can, in GitHub, make, like, a pull request that, or, like, a bug report that, okay, like, I made a fix for this. Can you add it to this? And then it fixes the problem. And you didn't have to do anything that, than to click maybe a few buttons and answer to somebody. If you, if you like, feel that your code, you want it to be av available in the future. Uh, otherwise, like, everything rots, code rots, like, it... It, it doesn't stay fresh uh, anywhere like and it's it's a well-known uh, problem throughout the world not only on on scientific computing and the like the easiest way is to, to is to keep it alive uh, and it, but if you don't feel like uh, keeping it alive it, well sometimes like eventually it becomes so rotten that nobody can anymore do it and that's a problem in scientific computing reproducibility issues are common so yeah i don't know yeah it might so sound a bit sullen but uh, like i i would personally like just try to tr try to keep track of the requirements and maybe use some some of these tools but uh, the main thing is like getting a community around the project and that will make it so that it's easier to update and it will standard test of time. I don't know, one option might be uh using some uh, sort of uh, IO library like HDF5, where you can actually organize your data a bit like, uh, I mean, you can really have the same kind of structure as in folders and files in, in normal file system. And it has also some, of course, you need a bit learning how to, how to use that, but it has also some other benefits for what uh, can store data quite efficiently. In principle, you can use it also for parallel input and output uh, you can have metadata that they're actually describing your data sets and so on. So that might be one option. One other option I would uh, probably recommend is to, is to think about, do you need to C++ to handle this thing? So, so can, you, can you utilize some of these more generic languages to, let's say, launch the program and then do the computationally expensive stuff on the C++ side? So all of these uh, languages that are presented uh, earlier, they can be extended with, let's say, C++. Uh, you can add these interfaces in all of them, R, C++, there's Python, has C++, uh, various different libraries, and Cython, and uh, MATLAB has its MEX things, and uh, Julia has, I don't know what it is, but 
definitely will have a C, has a C++ interface. So is it if possible, is it possible to use, let's say, as a client like this kind of like a, if you're running your C++ code, run it through like this something launches the C++ thing uh, that creates all of the folders and handles all of the user interaction and stuff like that. But the actual calculation is done on the bottom side with the actual code. That might also be an option. Yeah, there is actually for HDF5 that is very easy to use so Python package H55. So that's, and I mean, even even if you would be using the library primarily, I mean, generating the data with C++, you can actually then with a few lines of code with, from Python, you can actually read the data and do the analysis. Yeah. Also, Simo, haven't you given some talks on data analysis, like f formats and stuff like that? If the question goes beyond you doing something with CSV and so on, and to mm. what are good formats for data, yeah, then there's a lot more. Yeah, possible. now there's Pi Arrow uh, or Arrow as a whole. Pi Arrow is just a Python implementation. Forget that. But Arrow is this kind of like representation of how the data is represented in memory, and Parquet is the data format for that. That is for like data sets. If you have like table the table type data, that is the most common data form nowadays but yeah this is a separate uh, data structure that you might be interested in as well like hdf5 is great also uh, mainly it's mainly used for like uh, 3d data or 4d data or like this kind of big data blocks mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's really good as well yeah. it depends well, on uh, yeah. data and i guess it's more for if you have a numeric data so if you have a mixture of let's say text and uh, uh, numbers and so on, then it's maybe not, then there might be other options that are um, more suitable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next question will be really interesting. What's the role of containers such as Docker and Singularity in scientific computing? Mm. Well, maybe. Oh, Radovan, you had a I mean, one rule is to that in a container, it forces me, if I use containers, Docker or Singularity, it forces me to write down all the installation steps. So one rule and one benefit of doing this is that it's documented. There are other benefits, like it's actually like isolated and I can run a Linux container on a, on a Mac and I can run uh, Ubuntu container on a HPC cluster. But f for me, one really huge benefit is that it's documented for the future. Then it, yeah. it really helps for this reproducibility. So what we discussed that, okay, if you sort of uh, try to document the software with the, with the data and so on, I mean, with the, with the container, it's sort of, yeah, there is one specific container and and uh, one the operating systems uh, system libraries in in supercomputers uh, sometimes they can be a bit outdated and if you have a software with some complex dependencies which has been sometimes maybe developed more for let's say standard linux box it might be that sometimes it's a bit more might be difficult to install in in supercomputer environment, and containers can can really help there. Uh, I think if you are, and and for performance point of view, as long as you stay within a single node, I think the overhead from containerization is is relatively small. Then of course, if you want to run with multiple nodes, then things might get. I mean, you can still use containers, but things get more hairy. Yeah, I would say that like Docker is very popular nowadays because like you can run it like if you have uh, the problem with Docker is that you have to own the basically the machine where it runs on. You need to have a root access to it. So, but it's very popular when you're running stuff on on like uh, virtual like in the in the cloud like uh, uh, Amazon or somewhere. Uh, but uh, it's it's like it's easy to. Well, easy and easy. It's it's good 
for development when you want to like uh, contain the whole system in there and singularity is a good way of doing it on the HPC side but mo- both of these they are really like you need to have the correct nail so that it's a good hammer for it like you need to have this kind of a problem where you need the specific system you need the specific things to happen so that you run it like if your code doesn't need that much like if it doesn't depend on like it needs to run on ubuntu 18 or or something like it needs if it doesn't have this kind of a strict dependencies the it might not be worth using them because they might cause problems but at the same time it might make it your code is more easily reproducible uh, for some somebody else it depends so Maybe before we go on, I realized, can someone define what a container is and how it works for scientific computing? Well, I would say there is no difference in container in scientific computing versus computing in in general. But I mean, please define what it is because we're assuming people don't know what it yeah, is sure. in general. <laughs> um, Container is like the, you could think of a lightweight virtual machine. So when you have a virtual machine, uh, you have a sort of the whole oper- also the operating system kernel is is included there. And with containers, it's sort of uh, you use more of the features of the host operating system there. So it's you are not sort of virtualizing everything there. So it's sort of sandbox on top of the host operating system uh, which can have uh, i think it typically uses the same same kernel as the, as the host but uh, you can have a sort of uh, different libraries on top of that then yeah i would maybe say give it this kind of an analogy that if you've seen the movie truman show where the main character is business in this uh, dome where as yeah, the main character of a, of a reality TV series and he doesn't know that he's there. Uh, container is basically like that. Like it's it's not the actual world where he is living in, uh, but everybody else is pretending that it's like like okay, this is the world. So so basically, it works like that. Let's say you have an application that requires some diff- different things. Your application is basically the true man. He thinks uh, that he is working. Uh, going to work at a normal day but in reality everybody around this this person has been like played their plays their role around them so basically the whole operating system everything like that is like fake uh or not fake but it's like coming from outside uh it's defined by the developers of the (laughs) of the system and the real world what happens outside of the dome that's not something that is like uh that's not something uh uh, that the the, con- the person inside sees so the person cannot see outside of the container so basically you your application can do whatever they want in this fantasy world and and then they they can do different stuff so i would say it's a bit like that okay yeah mm. If there's no more comments, the next question is, should I write scripts like a fu- functions in a series executed or go for classes when you want to program a flow process? Hmm. Maybe we can... To me, I would sort of think like the question isn't much what programming techniques you use, but sort of how things fit together overall. Like, um, like I sort of have a feeling that the most important questions are at a larger scale than this somehow. I might have one opinion on this, uh, and and that is that. Like many frameworks, let's say, let's say, give an example, like a PyTorch framework, you have many things that are written as, as classes there, and you can basically reuse lots of the code available in the framework if your code extends these classes. 
So instead of like writing everything from scratch, you can make like a PyTorch dataset or whatever. Like you can you can you can make your uh, thing uh, of the similar type as the other other thing, like of of the some class in the framework, and you can reuse a lot of the or existing stuff. Uh, so that then you just have to maybe implement a few functions there and there and uh, it will do you can you reuse a lot of the other things so if you are using some framework and you can basically like get stuff for free if you if you utilize their framework uh classes are a great thing like if you, if you have a already existing like infrastructure that you can use uh but sometimes you might end up in a situation where you write a class and you've Right methods for the function, but in reality, when you run the stuff, you only have one instance of these at any time. So actually, functions would have been enough. And then having the class might make it, let's say, memory management a bit more complicated because, like, what's in there and what's self, and like, it might be easier to handle individual functions because you can test the individual functions. It doesn't. The functions don't deter, like, uh, don't depend on the state of the object itself and stuff like that so uh, but i would i would use classes whenever i can like get something for it otherwise i would probably go with functions yeah i just wrote in the hack md how um yeah maybe the real question is about workflow managers so maybe you shouldn't be writing a whole like if you're connecting lots of separate things that are going together, maybe the answer isn't to make these connections yourself, but you have something that pipelines the different steps in the process. And actually one of the lessons in the code refinery workshop is about reproducible research. And we go into things like some of these uh, workflow automation tools like Snakemake. The next question is related to code organiza organization, how to handle boilerplate like in C++ efficiently. Should you start writing classes at the beginning or use them as a way to refactor code later on? Well, I can say one of the, I don't know where I read this. I read something called the rule of three. And there's actually many rules of threes for many different topics, including many in computer science or programming. But if you do something once, just do it. If you do it twice, do it again. If you do it a third time, then it's worth trying to see when the, um, like how often you might be reusing it and try to make it really good and reproducible which I don't think is quite correct because there's sometimes I know I'm going to be reusing things many times. So I'll do my best from the start. But the reason for this is saying that until you've used it in several different contexts, you don't really know how general it needs to be or what all the different possibilities are. Uh, right on. Yeah, and great point is that you, we cannot really anticipate what we will need in future. So first, first step is, yeah, we, we get it to work and maybe this is good enough and maybe we are really happy. If we need to change it, it's good if it's easy to change. So I would, if I anticipate it, I will have to change the code. I would start in a way that it will be easy for me to change it. And it doesn't really answer that question, but for me, these two, two questions about, should I start with classes? Should I start with functions? They are really related. It's hard to answer but make it easy to change if you anticipate you were going to change but let's get it to work first later maybe let's make it faster and maybe let's make it nicer and i said i think it really depends on your problem if your problem really naturally fits into classes then i think it's a good idea to start with them if you don't know in beginning then maybe it's a bit easier to start with functions but... Not directly related to the question, but Varohan uh, gave a really, really good point here. Make it work. Um, it ha doesn't have to be fast. Having fast, uh, at least for example for Alto, that's for example what the what the RSEs can help you with, making the stuff fast. If it works, if it doesn't work, it's always more difficult because 
someone helping you doesn't really doesn't necessarily know uh what exactly your aim is and um doesn't necessarily know the complete logic or what why you're doing certain things and takes a lot longer to get into something but making it faster that's very often the same kind of procedures uh where you can switch some some inefficient loops for direct for um matrix computations uh, that are quicker because they're implemented in if you come from python from in c plus plus or even if it's in matlab um, because they are just inherently faster than any for loop um, but get it to work um, how it looks initially yeah it shouldn't look too bad but uh, <laughs> things can be improved yeah one thing that also came to my mind is that like i i personally wouldn't know the answer to this but I would probably myself, if I would have to do start like an UC plus plus project now, like immediately, like start one, I would look up some style guide somewhere and just go with that. Like look at the style guide that looks most pleasing to my eye from, let's say, I don't know, there's plenty of them, <laughs> but uh, look, look some style guide that uh, looks promising and maybe something that is related to where I want this to connect to. Like if I know that I want, the pipeline pipe to go here and I want data to go there then look at what their standard is like how do they write their code and maybe maybe it may try to use write similar looking code because then at the later later on it like if the pipe is round and the other pipe is round but a little, little smaller I need only a small like small uh, intermediate piece to connect them together but if the other pipe is a square one and the other pipe is a triangle one it, it might become quite complicated to to connect them together so so like looking at what uh what is the standard around the thing you're trying to work with and maybe go with that yeah any other thoughts on that well so next we have a question what's the difference between hpc and scientific computing can someone give a quick definition of hpc although we'll see more defini definitions of it tomorrow i think what uh, what is written there is is pretty much it so i think uh, using computing power much larger than you have in typical desktop machine, which of course means it, it's moving target. So my laptop 30 years ago, it would have been the world's most powerful supercomputer. <laughs> and scientific computing you can do with your laptop already. Yeah. It depends on your problem. So scientific computing doesn't need HPC and not all HPC is necessarily scientific computing, even though most of it is. And I would actually say that HPC is a um, kind of a mis mm, yeah, misnomer, uh, at least how it's commonly used. You have an HPC resource that allows a lot of people to use, uh, yeah, to, to essentially ex, uh, um, put their work away from their machine. And that's currently what the HPC cluster is. Um, there's a subset of those where they actually need more powerful resources and they need more uh, mul multiple piece or multiple nodes and stuff but that's at least on an hpc cluster i would almost almost say the minority most things are just they yeah they they ha have individual things that they are running outside or they have per yeah um, embarrassingly parallel things that yes run them on multiple machines and you only have the one. Um, yeah. But that's to me not um, the thing that I would define as high perform uh, needing a high performance computation per se, at least. Yeah. yeah, I would probably say that the high performance is a bit of a misnomer to me. Like, like it's, it doesn't really tell that much. Like I would put it more like resource intensive or like, like something like, like basically there's, there are problems that require so much money that 
nobody can buy the really like the machine themselves like that's the situation so basically ministry of uh, education or the university will or like uh, academy of finland or somebody gets gets the money done and for that we need a system that can like provide uh, then like value for that money and and for that to happen it needs to be a shared system among multiple different fields multiple different users and it makes it like a shared system and it this brings like this kind of a like its own tools and own things that you can do it and but it also gives it the own benefits that you can do big stuff on it like you can do bigger things that you can do on a laptop so it's it's like high re- you have plenty of like big resource uh, maybe big resource computing would be better or something like that but but like the performance comes if you utilize the big resources but the performance doesn't come like uh, magically like the high performance ca- like basically the uh, the ceiling is high but the floor is the same as in your laptop so uh, you need to uh, utilize it to, to its full effect to get the resources or get the stuff done but it's basically like a place place where you can run stuff that doesn't fit your laptop somebody else pays it okay so we're almost running out of time here there's a few questions at the bottom um which were answered already above um please keep on adding the question we can also answer during the break by text um maybe this physics students like to write c plus plus and so on is there anything else to add other than what radovan has written there maybe we're running out of time so yeah. maybe I'd, we can oh, go ahead Simon. yeah I'd, I'd probably want to answer the next question that that's been asked in multiple ways in, in many situations like the question that how do you estimate resources needed for SBC? Uh, we will talk about this later on the coming days when we actually make these resource requests. But uh, I would say that uh, the baseline is that if it does it run on your laptop, if it runs on your laptop, you can look at the back of the box of your laptop or whatever, how much resources your laptop has and ask the similar kind of a thing. Uh, if it, then you, we have usually tools that you can check whether how much it actually used, like after the fact. If it doesn't run on your laptop, then you take some, multiply most likely the memory with some uh, factor, and then you check if it runs. And if it runs, then you check how long does it work. And then you, well, I would use as a benchmark, like as a comparison, the laptop. How long does it take? Put the similar kind of, like if it took four hours on your laptop, put similar resource request, four hours, similar amount of processor, similar amount of memory, and see how it goes. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we need to go for a break now. So what happens after the break is we get started with connecting to the computational cluster. So this is really a preparation for tomorrow, where we go and we get hands-on with the cluster and go doing all of these things. So it'll start with a little demo and then there'll be private time for um, the learner Zoom breakout room if you need hands-on help. Um, yeah, and the rest of the session, the rest of these days is really about using this cluster. So like we were discussing, what is HPC? What are these different ways of using the resources? So we'll start with the basics of um, Let's see, we'll start with the basics of like how to connect and how to run programs and then see how to get more and more resources in different ways and how to make your program usable here. So uh, some of you may have come just for the first day and won't attend the other days. Perhaps some people will be coming just for the later days and not today, but we will make it all work for everyone. Please feel free to continue adding in more questions in HackMD, and we can give answers via text during the break also. 
anything else to say before the break? Okay, I guess not. So we can break for 10 minutes. So we'll start a little bit after the hour. Okay, so great. Um, well, thanks to everyone who was here so far. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists here, Radovan, UC, Thomas, and Simo, for making this a very interesting discussion. And we will see you in 10 minutes. Bye. Thanks, bye. Okay, bye. bye.